Good afternoon, I'm Larry Scogan, the Interim Chancellor of the North Dakota University System, and I want to welcome all of you to the campus of Bismarck State College for uh, what will be our final conversation for the 2014-2015 uh, conversations at BSC. Um, usually my colleague here demurs as to any sort of introduction for him, but because we have gone through this whole series, I introduce him at the first one, and, and I'm going to introduce him at the last one for folks in the TV audience that are not familiar with Clay or, or don't know all that we know about him, those of us that are here in Bismarck. Uh, Clay is, of course, an award-winning historical performer and the voice of his alter-ego, Thomas Jefferson, on the weekly NPR program, The Thomas Jefferson Hour. He has published half a dozen books, including the award-winning edition of the writings of the Lewis and Clark Expedition in North Dakota, A Vast and Open Plain. He writes a weekly Sunday column for the Bismarck Tribune and travels extensively as a historical performer. Clay is the Distinguished Scholar of the Humanities at Bismarck State College and the Principal Consultant of the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University. He holds degrees in humanities from the University of Minnesota and Oxford University. Please welcome Clay Jenkins. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Before we get into our conversation, Clay, I, I want uh, the folks, our, the viewers and the folks that are here to know a little bit about the symposium that we're going to be hosting right here on the campus of Bismarck State College in November. So get out your uh, um, calendars and mark down November 3 through 5, 2015, we're going to be doing a 1960s symposium. And uh, we've been doing all sorts of stuff talking about, and we've got a lot of people at BSC have been engaged in faculty and staff, been engaged in the conversations of, of what we ought to be doing. And I want to take a quick survey here of our audience today, uh, because one of the individuals that were really uh, interested, and Clay has been in contact with his people, interested in bringing to the 1960s symposium is the astronaut Buzz Aldrin. And so we want to find out how many people in here would show up at a symposium to see Buzz Aldrin. Well, okay, that's almost unanimous. So, Is there anyone who objects because he was on Dancing with the Stars? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be a... You know, People say, oh, get the younger generation. That's probably yeah. the way they know yeah. Buzz Aldrin. But think about where we are when we think about the 1960s. And, and uh, judging from this audience, most people here uh, can remember the 1960s. And you think about how exciting the space program was for us and how exciting it was in July of 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were on the moon. And that's actually a long time ago. It's amazing. And, and to think that um, there were 12, 12 men, and they were all men, 12 men have walked on the moon, and I think eight are still alive. Eight are alive. He's the yeah. oldest, by the way. Buzz Aldrin, Colonel second, Aldrin, second okay. man on the moon. Um, and he is certainly the best known now. Um, he's written a number of books, including most recently one called uh, Magnificent Desolation. When he first stepped off the lunar lander, he looked around and joined Neil Armstrong, and they planted an American flag on the surface of the moon. And then he looked around and he said, magnificent desolation. Mm. And so he's written, I think, five, maybe six books now. And he's had some struggles. Um, you know, he said, uh, in I think his first book, Return to Earth, he said, when you've been to the moon, what's left? Mm -hmm. And he's really struggled to try to make sense of how to fit that into not only American life, but, but his own life's trajectory. And so I, I find him fascinating. I've written a little bit about him, and I, 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 I don't know if you know this, but I was once mistaken for him. <clears throat> this will be interesting. And so I was, <laughs> I was teaching these, a couple of law courses at UND Law on literature and the law and the idea of the law and Western traditions. And I was staying in this UND faculty apartment complex. And so I would go up there three or four days a week, and there was a, one of those places where you could come down and get your mail, and I was getting my mail, and this woman came up, and she said, oh, are you, are you Buzz Aldrin? <laughs> and I was in my 30s, and she was in her 30s, and she wasn't wearing a ring. <laughs> um, and I thought, why not? You know, <laughs> I know a lot about the moon landing. Um, I can, but no, human virtue and honesty set in, and I said, I'm sorry. 
I'm so sorry that I'm not Buzz Aldrin, but um, if I'd like, if you want a message, I'll try to get it to him. You know, but <laughs> so now I wrote, to, I, I wrote to him last week because he is, his fee is gigantic, and I gave him a number of reasons why he should come to North Dakota. And I said that we would, you know, we, I said we can't afford you. We really can't afford you. It's way less than you're worth, but way more than we have. And I made an offer, and I, th I think he's. I think he's going to come. Okay. Wouldn't that be something? That would be exciting. Um, so, so what motivated the young lady to confuse you with Colonel Aldrin? She, I, I think it was just that she, because I was at the mailboxes and, and mine was, I think, close to Colonel Aldrin's, and I think it was just, she was hoping it was him. And it turns out it was just me, and so that's that. Okay. Mm. I've looked at the moon through a telescope. <laughs> but, uh, you can yeah. recognize the moon on site. That's it. Okay. All right. But wouldn't it okay. be great so if he came? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic. So, so we're working on that. And, and uh, we have a number of, um, of uh, scholars from the 60s, and we're working on personalities of the 60s, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a great time here. So, the, so that's November 3rd through 5th, 2015, and that will be held right here in this room, uh, the Bavendick State Room on the campus of Bismarck Vietnam, State College. Vietnam, Richard Nixon, LBJ, the fall of Saigon. Watergate, the counterculture, the Beatles coming to America, Woodstock. It's really the most pivotal and iconic decade of the post-World War II period. And so to look back on it is just going to be a great joy. It'll be great fun. So now let's go into our conversation on the national parks here, Clay. So, um... so we have Valerie Naylor with us. Valerie Naylor is the former superintendent of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And uh, it's a close friend of mine, and she agreed to come today to make some comments later in the program. Valerie, just raise your hand. So Valerie's here. Um, so that puts us sort of on the spot. Um, mm -hmm. Keep her off the stage as long as possible, because otherwise she'll correct our mistakes. Right, right. Uh, but let's just talk a little, a little bit about this. So this is a huge topic, and I'm so glad uh, to see Randy Hudson Bueller here from the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation, because I've been reading a lot of books on this subject about when national parks work and when they have trouble. And many of them do have trouble and struggle. Struggle with the local agricultural community or struggle with the environmental community or struggle with the development on the peripheral towns and so on. And the, all the books that I've read say the same thing. When the relationship between the gateway town and the national park is healthy and honest and mutually creative, the national parks thrive. And I think, I really do think that's fair to say. I've, I haven't seen all the national parks, but I've been to lots of them. And I think it's fair to say that Medora is the most tasteful national park gateway town anywhere in this country. I, I don't think there's a better one for a certain modesty, you know, not the schlock that you see in many places, um, a, a sense of historical heritage. And it really makes a difference. And if you've been to Keystone, South Dakota, or West Yellowstone, or Gatlinburg, Tennessee, you see what the much, I, so, I guess I'll say schlockier, gateway town looks like. And I think it's really something. And I, it goes back, of course, to Harold and Shyla Schaefer. Harold wanted authenticity. He, he, he wanted, when, when the Badlands Motel was built, um, now being completely remodeled and wonderfully, but Harold didn't want televisions in the rooms because he didn't want people to sit in the rooms. He wanted people to get out into the park or get out into the, into the village of Medora, get out and see something. And so that, that philosophy that Harold had, this is the 50th anniversary now of the Medora musical, but his philosophy of doing it right, making it historical, avoiding crass commercialism, has really set the tone, and now the TRMF and Randy and, and all, all the people doing it now are continuing. That's so important because this can go wrong really quickly, and it has not done that here. All right, so this was our, one of our titles. Just, let's just quickly talk about origins. The first national park was in 1872, Yellowstone. And it really, even though it's one of the world's supreme parks to this day, and it sort of is the iconic national park, Historically speaking, it's kind of a one-off. 
there wasn't really an idea of national parks yet. There was no, there was no national constituency for national parks. There was no environmental movement. There was really, the, even the conservation movement was in its, was, was really finding its vocabulary. And so this, this sort of just happened. It, you know, it's fully 30 years before Theodore Roosevelt got warmed up on this subject. 1872, signed by Ulysses S. Grant. And the reason, and you'll be speaking about this in a minute, but the reason that it was selected in 1872 is twofold. One is, there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, literally, there's nothing like it in the world. And secondly, it was in danger of being exploited by timber barons and railroad barons and uh, people searching for mines and um, poachers and so on. And so there was a sense that this is too great a thing to allow to pass into routine economic development or to be parceled out in any sense. And so we must, as a nation, preserve this. And it, but, it, but it didn't immediately create a movement. It wasn't until 1890, so that's you know, 18 years later, that the next few national parks were named at all. So the origins of this are really Thomas Jefferson and George Catlin. Jefferson uh, was you know, the foremost visionary of the American West, and he, the, not, I won't go into detail, but at this time there was this, the concept that the West was a kind of a new Garden of Eden. And Patrick Henry, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Thomas Paine in Common Sense had written the sentence, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. The idea was that here was this unspoiled continent, no cathedrals, no feudal land systems, uh, no castles, just in, in a sort of Edenic primordial state. Now they always conveniently ignored the fact that there were several million Native Americans living here, but when they envisioned this, it was this primordial New Eden. And Jefferson was one of the philosophers of that idea, and he bought the natural bridge in Virginia. The natural bridge is in southwestern, south central Virginia. And he bought it in the 1770s because he was afraid that somebody would misdevelop it. And so he thought, we, there are certain things that are so, and the term they used then was sublime, that there are certain places in America that are so sublime that you just must find a way to preserve them as a commons, as something for the whole country and not to divide up into private property. So he purchased it. And now Monticello is, I think, buying it back. It's been in private uh, commercial development for a long time, and Monticello has been negotiating either to get it as a national site or a state site or its own site, because Jefferson believes so strongly in it. So here's what he said, Larry. Everyone can read along with this. This is from his only book, Notes on Virginia. He went there many times, and he used to take visitors there. So if, if visitors came from Europe or somewhere, he would take them down to see the natural bridge. This is a painting from uh, his own era, not a, not a great one, but of him as sort of the, the uh, impresario who is showing people this place. And in Notes on Virginia, he said this. He said, it is impossible for the emotions arising from the sublime to be felt beyond what they are here, so beautiful an arch, so elevated, so light, and springing, as it were, up to heaven. The rapture of the spectator is really indescribable. And that, the word sublime in this period meant it was so impressive that you, you sort of had a mini instantaneous nervous breakdown. It overwhelmed you, and you, your brain couldn't absorb the magnificence or the grandeur or the scale of it, and you had your brain blanked. You, you could faint. So look at this in the next paragraph. He says this. This is a, um, an 1860s painting. Look how tiny the people are in the painting. It's, it's, it's not in true scale. But this is what he said again in Notes on Virginia. Though the sides of this bridge, so he's on the top. Think of Thomas Jefferson on the top of this bridge. Though the sides of this bridge are provided in some parts with a parapet of fixed rocks. In other words, there's a kind of retaining wall. Yet few men have resolution to walk to them and look over into the abyss. You involuntarily fall on your hands and feet, creep to the parapet, and peep over it. Looking down from this height about a minute gave me a violent headache. Mm. Oh, so I'm sure Hamilton would have sneered at this. Yeah. You know, oh, so you got a headache on the bridge, you know. But 
but Jeffrey, this is part of the sublime. You're meant to have this faint. You have to go down on your hands and knees, and you're overwhelmed by the sheer magnificence of the place. So that's Jefferson. And so in, in, in most accounts of the development of the National Park System idea, Jefferson is sort of the founding father of this, of this concept. So then George Catlin you know, came here in, in the early 1830s on a steamboat, and he painted some of the greatest paintings ever of Native Americans and the upper Missouri country. And when he was concluding his own book, he wrote a great book on the subject, on his travels. Here's what he said. This is the most explicit thing ever said about this in that era. This is 1832. He says, and what a splendid contemplation, too, when one who has traveled these realms and can duly appreciate them imagines them as they might in future be seen by some great protecting policy of government mm -hmm preserved in their pristine beauty and wildness in magnificent park where the world could see for ages to come the native Indian in his classic attire galloping his wild horse with sinewy bow and shield and lance amid the fleeting herds of elks and buffaloes. And he goes on to say, same, same passage in his book, what a beautiful and thrilling specimen for America to preserve and hold up to the view of her refined citizens and the world in future ages, a nation's park containing man and beast in all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty, I would ask no other monument to my memory nor any other enrollment of my name amongst the famous dead than the reputation of having been the founder of such an institution. So he, he had in mind some sort of gigantic reserve that would be part of the Dakotas and part of Montana and part of maybe even Minnesota, that would be a permanent nation's park, a national park, but featuring native peoples that would be somehow encouraged to stay in their traditional life ways and hunt buffalo and, and do all the things they did before industrialization. And here's one of his great paintings. Um, they've been on display up at the Lewis and Clark Ford Mandan Foundation. And he and, Car and Carl Bodmer are the two great painters. They came within a year of each other, but but Catlin was certain that this land, A, would never be settled by farmers. It was too wild and too dry and no trees. And B, that it was so pristine still that it was, it was, it was, it was like, it would be a giant natural museum of, of hundreds of thousands of acres or millions of acres to preserve this, this vanishing life way. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Before we move on to the, the next stage here, back up a couple slides. Yes, sir. Is, talk about eh, more you know, th this works this okay. works um, so right here where we're talking about this magnificent park at what point because I know we're going to talk about it um, from 1872 on but if Thomas Jefferson is sort of the the godfather of all this at what point would there have been any discussion about the tension created in we've got this massive movement of settlers moving into this free land, right? Free land for free soil for free men. The Homestead Act to come along in the 1860s. And we've got that big movement going on and then somebody else saying, yeah, but we need to preserve part of that. We're, those, we're gonna talk about after 1870. I know those conversations come up and we'll talk about the military's involvement in that. But way back with Catlin and Jefferson, were there already conversations about preserving something and the tension that creates and trying to give away free land? And but That's always a tension to this day. You know, if you, it, it, so we'll come, we'll, we will come back to it. Let me just say this much about it at the moment. There wasn't a very widespread conversation about it because of a couple of things. One, Yellowstone was seen as unique, which it is, you know, it's not, it's not even Glacier or Mount Rainier or Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a unique set of geological features that is not replicated really anywhere else in the world. And everyone got that, that if, there, if you're going to have one place that you do this with. It's, and so that was one thing. So there were two criteria early on. It's changed. The National Park Service today is a huge umbrella that embraces recreational areas and historic homes and industrial sites and um, battlefields and traditional national parks and non-traditional parks. And it's a huge umbrella, maybe too, maybe too wide, but it, but it is, is certainly grown out of the Yellowstone Glacier paradigm. And, but there were two criteria to become a national park until 
I'd say the, the era of Woodrow Wilson. So that'd be around 19, you know, 16. One was that it was so magnificent or sublime that it just had to be protected. That's the Yosemite, Rainier, Yellowstone paradigm. And if we had done that, we would probably have Zion and Canyon lands. And I mean, there are such places that are either unique or nearly so, or are just so magnificent they just take your breath away. The other criterion was, and an important one, and this goes to your question, the place needed to be perceived as otherwise economically worthless. In other words, you had to say, well, it's not clear what, what we could exploit here economically. And so, and worthless at this time meant homesteads and villages, some mining. But if it, if, if it could be shown that this is a place that probably doesn't have other explicit economic value, and it's beautiful, it qualifies. But wherever there was per perception of economic value, I mean, the most famous early case of this is Grand Teton. So Grand Teton is, as everyone knows, is sort of the bottom peninsula right off of Yellowstone. And there was a small Grand Teton National Park, but the Rockefeller family owned huge parts of it and bought more, and they wanted to gift Jackson Hole to the National Park System to create a much larger uh, Grand Teton National Park. And the fight was ferocious because ranchers and hunters and resort owners and others said, nuts to that. I mean, this is a, one of the great economic engines. You've got a big park up there. You even got some of the Tetons down here in this incredibly lush valley. Why should we let the federal government take control of that, even if there's a willing seller, because that will then push out other economic activity, and it's, it'll, be, it'll amount to a taking under the Fifth Amendment to people who are already doing things here. And because of that, there are special conditions of the enabling legislation for Grand Teton that allow hunting, for example, and other types of activities that are not allowed in other national parks because this was seen as a unique problem. And since, since that movement, the kind of pushback movement began, it's increasingly hard to, to do this. For one thing, we've, we've taken up most of the obvious national parks, and we've, and we've taken up the ones that are in the public domain and are not heavily privately owned. But there has been this conversation throughout, and it continues, and you'll see. I mean, the, this, this conversation will never go away because economic interests matter, and the United States is, is uniquely committed to to the primacy of private property values. We're seeing it in the, in the Bakken oil fields, too. Right, right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So, all right, so now you. Okay. So when this happened, yeah. it was 1916 when we got the National Park Service. So the first national parks were already in place, and they had been sort of administered in, a, in an ad hoc way. And then it was perceived that there was going to have to be a professionalization of the service. and you. You reviewed yep. a book on this subject. Um, and I recommend to anybody that's interested in the parks, uh, if you want to get sort of the, the prehistory to the National Park Service itself, uh, Harvey Meyerson has written a wonderful book called Nature's Army, and it's about the role that the United States Army played in the preservation of the parks from 1872 up to 1916, then when the National Park Service is actually established. And it really is in incredible because it goes back to Thomas Jefferson again. So the question Meyerson asked, and I don't know how long you want me to as talk on this. Want. Okay. <laughs> um, the question that that Meyerson points to is that, or his thesis is that, there did not exist in the United States another federal agency that had sort of the national patriotic scope that the army would have. So the Army was the natural agency to ask to start protecting national parks. So, uh, and he points back to Thomas Jefferson. In 1802, the United States Military Academy, what we normally call West Point, West Point was established by Thomas Jefferson. And it's an incredibly democratic process of appointments from congressional districts all come together at West Point. It's an engineering school. Officers were trained there to be engineers, but they're also trained to be incredible observers of nature, 
the National Weather Service comes out of this same sort of heritage um, because the officers, uh, the, the officers with what was called the old army traveled all over the United States. They kept logs, they kept diaries, they made the maps, they were all cartographers, they kept the weather data, they did all of that sort of stuff. So they were naturally trained to be the observers that Meyerson, and I agree with him, that could make those same sort of observations in the national parks. But also what the Army had is they had a national network. So logistics, they, they knew how to get supplies from point A to point B, and oftentimes across incredible expanses of land. They knew how to communicate across these uh, same expanses and these same distances. So the Army had all of the mechanisms put in place. So in 1872 then with uh, Yellowstone Park, um, what the immediate thing that comes up is how dare you take that land out of private hands and, <clears throat> excuse me, so loggers, Clay already mentioned them, uh, it, it was called timber depredations and these were the people who would just move into these public lands and start cutting down trees. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, hunters that would come. Uh, the shepherds, they would, uh, they had herd their sheep onto these lands and just, and, and, and everybody knows about sheep, they'll eat the grass right down to nothing and eat the roots. And so, um, so they were destroying these public lands. So it fell upon the United States Army to get these folks out of those areas and to protect it. And it actually started with Phil Sheridan, who then marched 150 soldiers into the brand new uh, Yellowstone National Park. He marched 150 soldiers in there, uh, set up camps, and started chasing out the, basically the squatters that had come into and that the, land. The poachers and the commercial the poachers, hunters. And commercial outfits and all that sort of stuff. And they end up doing the same thing in California with Yosemite. So again, another theme is that from the beginning there's been an enforcement need in the national parks to prevent people from um, stealing artifacts or you know, killing bighorn taking, sheep. Taking or, it over. Yeah. You know, picking up natural objects. And, and so the army was naturally prepared and they're fighting against this group that's, in, in fact, one group, one of the criticisms was, how dare the federal government tell us that we can't take the, the trees and we can't uh, graze our sheep on the land? How dare the federal government do that? And Never so that it was the ta Yeah, and it really goes back, or it, it really is tied to the Sagebrush Rebellion Ronald Reagan was famous for. So let me show you a slide here about this. this. Federal government out here. Is <laughs> President Roosevelt made a western journey of, uh, of 14,000 miles, 25 states in 1903. It was the longest presidential journey ever up till that point. And he went to two national parks. He, he spent two weeks in Yellowstone with John Burroughs, the great naturalist. We'll come back to him. And he spent uh, about three days in Yosemite with John Muir, the, the great preservationist. And here he is with Major John Pritcher, a pitcher who is the superintendent of, Theodore, of, of Yellowstone National Park. And do you see him? He is, he is a military man in this case. So he's wearing a military. As the superintendent. As the superintendent. Park. All right, so then look at this. This is, I love this photograph um, from the collections at Dickinson State University's Theodore Roosevelt Center. Uh, that's TR, of course, in the middle. On his right, our left, is John Burroughs, uh, who was one of the great nature writers of the period, close friend of TR. Uh, Pitcher is over here all the way on my left, uh, Roosevelt's right, and on his, Roosevelt's left, is William Loeb, his private secretary, who traveled around with him and took dictation and sent letters, and he had to stay back. When Roosevelt went into the park for two weeks, this couldn't happen today. But he said, no security, no reporters, no White House staff, including his private secretary, William Loeb. He said, I'm going alone into the park with Burroughs and a few park um, officers. And I, want, I don't want anyone to interrupt me for any purpose for two weeks, and he, and he held to it. Imagine this today. I mean, if, if the president, George W. Bush or Barack Obama, wanted to go spend a few days in Glacier National Park or Yellowstone, it would create 
in insane chaos, and nobody would ever allow them to be alone anywhere on Earth now. So I love this photograph. It's, they're just before they go into the park, and poor Loeb uh, has to stay, stay behind and handle the press for two weeks. Now, to get to your point, the, in the military transition, when the National Park Service comes in in 1916, there are former military people who want to be right. Uh, park there, there are actually a number of officers that were resigned from the Army and joined the National Park Service in 1960. And you can see the very close ties in the, in, the, in the uniforms between the United States Army in that era and the early National Park Service. Mm -hmm. And here, I love this one. Um, here's this modern <laughs> park employee. She's got a taser. She's got a pistol. I was just reading the other day that in, in Yosemite, in the 1980s, they built a 22-bed jail in Yosemite. And when Valerie was just completing her work here, um, she said that enforcement is a, is a significant issue in the national parks, particularly now in the North Unit, because, of course, it's right where all the activity is. But enforcement, even if it's not about an oil boom, enforcement in national parks has to do with drugs, guns, fights between people with competing stereos, um, poaching, a whole you know, wide range of things. And so there is still a military law enforcement aspect to the national park system. Anything else you want to say about this book? Um, <clears throat> no, no. You've got a little yeah, frog yeah, in your yeah. throat. You Go ahead. Get some Go more ahead. water. You're you all right? right? Yep. Proceed. Because we were, we were with you there. Yeah, that's OK. I think you had more to say, Larry. No, that's all right. all right. OK, so avoiding the schlock effect. We sort of alluded to this already. But <clears throat> the organic act. So you have these first national parks that have just kind of burbled up for different reasons. And when Theodore Roosevelt was president, he and Gifford Pinchot and, and people who were thinking about the West said, you know, we need to professionalize a park service. We need, we need to create some sort of system where trained professionals, not just available military people, will handle this. And it wasn't TR's legislation that came after he was dead, but he was one of, in those early conversations. And, and he and George Bird Grinnell and others in the Boone and Crockett Club had actually helped to save Yellowstone National Park. There was a move to put a railroad line through it and to cut part of the park off for commercial uses and to put up all sorts of grand hotels and to, and to have it much more commercialized. And Roosevelt and the Boone and Crockett Club said, no, that's not, the, that's not the idea of a national park. In a national park, you want to lower the number of amenities. You want to go back into a less sophisticated, less civil state. You don't want to just go there and be at another hotel that you could maybe get at Saratoga Springs in ups upstate New York or the Catskills. You want to go and rough it. That's the idea. And, and furthermore, said Roosevelt, the national parks need to be available to everybody, not just the rich and the privileged, but every American should have access on an equal basis and without prohib uh, prohibitive fees to, the, to our national parks. And so the, the Boone and Crockett Club, which was a private nonprofit, played a huge role in helping to establish this philosophy. But in 1916, finally, the Organic Act, and here's what it says. This is one of the most contested sentences <coughs> in American history. The purpose of the National Parks, said the Organic Act, was to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So there are two missions here. One is to provide pleasure for people going into the national parks, for them to have pleasurable experiences for recreation. And the other is to preserve unimpaired those very parks for future generations. And those two competing missions are in a kind of yin-yang dynamic conversation throughout the history of the National Park Service, including today. because. And there's a paradox in this. So even if, so sometimes it bends more towards recreation, and you see a whole building boom of interpretive centers and campgrounds and all sorts of things. And then other periods, it, it veers back towards a more preservationist, the unimpaired language comes to the front. But even if you move towards the unimpaired side, you still need numbers. You need to be able to demonstrate to Congress that 
that there are, the people like this and they come to the parks. And so there's constantly a, a need to prove that lots of people come. That's at odds in some ways with the notion of keeping it unimpaired. And so even the unimpaired people need numbers. And so this paradox has, has never been adequately resolved. And all superintendents at, at local parks or in the national system have to wrestle with this. And there are, you, these are huge policy debates that go on continuously. And in the same Organic Act, we learned, oh, what, what? all right, so let's go to, the Lane letter was written about the same time. This is a, a letter by uh, Franklin Lane, who was a interior secretary, and he was working with Stephen Mathers, who was the first director of the National Park Service, and he said, every activity of the service, the National Park Service, is subordinate to the duties imposed upon it to faithfully preserve the parks for posterity in essentially their natural state. Well, today, in any given year, more than 3.5 million people go to Yosemite. I mean, think of that. The population of North Dakota is 700,000. Every year, more than 3.5 million people go through the gates at Yosemite, and they want ice cream, and they want toilets, and they want souvenirs, and they want to have lodges, they want um, a 5K race or an Ironman to be there. They want hookups for their campgrounds. They want internet. They want coffee shops, swimming pools. And yet, says Lane, that whatever you develop in these parks needs to be done in a way that subordinates it to faithfully preserving the parks for posterity in essentially their natural state. Nobody could say that Yosemite is in essentially its natural state. I think you can say that of Theodore Roosevelt National Park to a much higher degree. But this is, this is the problem, that this, there's a, it's not just that, you know, the parks are underfunded or that people don't know how to use parks. It's that in the very basis, the bylaws of the system, there are these, um, these, these tensions. The Lane letter goes on. In studying new park projects, you should seek to find scenery of supreme and distinctive quality or some natural feature so extraordinary or unique as to be of national interest and importance. The national park system as now constituted should not be lowered in standard dignity and prestige by the inclusion of areas which express in less than the highest terms the particular class or kind of exhibit which they represent. Uh, he also said, uh, Franklin Lane, the Secretary of the Interior. And this is um, a really important thing for all of us to remember. He said, even if a national park is in Wyoming or Oregon or California or Carolina, it's a national park. It's, there is a national duty to the park. Even if everyone in um, the surround to Smoky Mountains National Park wanted to put a dome over it or uh, build um, a, a railroad that ran along the entire perimeter of the park. His view was no, the local people's interests, whatever they happen to be, must always be subordinate to their status as national treasures. So you think about that. I mean, we, I've been following the issues at Theodore Roosevelt National Park with heavy uh, peripheral development, and we, we, or with the elk issue of a number of years ago, and there's always a North Dakota um, political discussion of these things, as there should be. But Valerie Naylor has said a number of times, but this is a, this is a national park, and therefore it has a national status. It's, it's, it's not just something that North Dakotans love, it's something that's a treasure for the entire nation. So a lot of these places, like Hot Springs in Arkansas, or Saratoga Springs in New York or other places got developed before the National Park Movement really got started, and there's a certain kind of commercial schlockiness to them. And one of the most interesting was um, Mount Rushmore. I don't know if you know this, but the original plan, um, a man named Don Robinson, a historian in South Dakota, wanted to create a uh, reason for tourists to go to the Black Hills, and the original plan that he and Gustav, Gustav Borglum were talking about was to use the needles, the, the granite needles in South Dakota, and to carve on them the faces of Western heroes like Jim Bridger and 
Meriwether Lewis and Kit Carson and Wyatt Earp and so Annie Oakley. And so this is a little bit of you know pathetic um, imagination, but this is what he had in mind. You know that on, that these would be carved in granite, and on these granite needles, which are unbelievably beautiful, that Borglum would go up there and, and carve Annie Oakley or carve Wyatt Earp. Fortunately. The needles have fissures and so on that it was perceived that they couldn't sustain that type of sculpture. But imagine if this were the case, how weird this would be. Um, here's Keystone, South Dakota. Thank goodness for Medora, right? Here's uh, Dollywood next to Smoky Mountain. So here you are in the Great Smoky Mountains, one of the most beautiful national parks the most visited, by the way, of all our national parks to this day, uh, in eastern Tennessee and the Carolinas. And it has many <laughs> rivers and waterfalls and water features. So what do they do? They build a waterfall in town. And this is sort of the mediated experience that lots of people go to national parks and don't actually go to them or go very briefly. And then they go to town where they want a, a tamer version of the same presented to them. And so this, is, this happens all over the country. Here's Gatlinburg, right in the heart, right on the edge of Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Here's what the park really looks like. Look at that. See the difference? <laughs> so when Ken Burns, quoting Wallace Stegner, says, the national parks are, quote, America's best idea. I mean, imagine if this movement hadn't occurred. I lived by Lake Tahoe for 15 years, and Lake Tahoe is one of the world's most beautiful places. Imagine if it had been a national park, or even part of it. But this is what a national park looks like, and this is what happens if you don't have some attitude in that direction. So here's the natural bridge, Jefferson's natural bridge in Virginia. Fortunately, it's, it's going to be handled by a nonprofit hereafter. Here's what happens every night in the summer. This is, again, the mediated experience. So you, you have this incredible thing that Jefferson said is worth a trip across the Atlantic to see, on the top of which he fainted, peeped over the parapet. And then every summer, there is this sort of pageantry to make it prettier. You know, <laughs> Think of the paradox here. Oh, can't we make that prettier? Um, and here's the kind of development that occurs in places like that. This is an old postcard of the Natural Bridge Hotel. And you can't, I've been to the Natural Bridge a bunch of times because it's so, it's important in Jefferson's world. And you can't get to it without paying a fee, a pretty hefty one, so that it's not that democratic notion that Roosevelt was talking about. And you have to go through the giant souvenir store before you can get to the natural bridge itself. And so th that's the commercial model at Hot Springs and Saratoga and others. Here's what, this is a different arch, of course. This is what Edward Abbey wanted it to look like. It's pristine and close to the way God created it as absolutely possible with the least possible human industrial intrusion. You see the difference? You know? So here's what Roosevelt said. This was when he was at the Grand Canyon in 1903. He saw it for the first time. He had never been there before, never been to Arizona or California before. He was on that giant trip. He stopped, and, and they were planning some economic developments on the South Rim. And this was not a speechwriter. This wasn't something that he had premeditated. He just looked over into the Grand Canyon. He, he didn't have what we have, the advantage of documentaries and video and posters and so on. He was seeing something in, for the first time in a way that we don't get to anymore. And here's what he said uh, spontaneously. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. I just think that should be the motto of when you go into any national park in this country. It should just be Roosevelt. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. So let's talk about Roosevelt. You still okay? And you? I'm doing fine. What is it? What happened? Uh, it could go on. We, yeah. we need to get you some medical attention. <laughs> Here's our man. So there's a debate in, in, in 
conservation circles about how Roosevelt became the greatest conservation president in American history, which he certainly was. Jimmy Carter in Alaska in the late 70s set aside more acreage than Roosevelt had ever done. But it was Alaska. You know, it's, it's easier there. And Alaska was really untouched in many respects. And this had to do with native settlements, events, and so on. So if you, if you make Carter a kind of asterisk in this way, Roosevelt then takes his, I think, rightful place as the number one conservation president in American history. And, and some of that, at least, he learned here. He, when, he, when he came here between 1883 and 1887, he saw that there was already overgrazing. Uh, he saw that the numbers of buffalo were approaching zero, the numbers of elk were approaching zero. And yes, he did hunt all of those creatures, but he also helped the Boone and Crockett Club set up um, recovery programs for these creatures. But he's recognized something, and I think he, it's really true that he recognized it here during those critical years. And this is what fueled him. Then as governor of New York, he worked hard to save wild places in New York, including its state park system. And that was his proving ground for when he became president. And when he became president, he sort of went crazy with this concept. I mean, he could never get away with it today, but altogether, during the course of his seven years and 171 days in office, Roosevelt set aside 230 million acres of the public domain. So the Louisiana Purchase was 570 million acres. Roosevelt set aside about half of the Louisiana Purchase in size. Just think of how much we're talking about as national forest, national park, national monument, national game preserve, or National Wildlife Refuge. 230 million acres. Uh, Yellowstone is 1.2 million acres. And then we're talking about an unbelievable achievement. Here he is in 1903 in Yosemite, sitting alone. And here he is in 1903 with John Muir in Yosemite. And they camped um, below Half Dome. It snowed. They, uh, Muir wouldn't let Roosevelt bring a sleeping bag or a tent. Muir was really a purist. And so TR was happy to do that. And, and Muir cut some um, branches and of, of um, you know, spruce and, and so on and put them down for their mattresses. And they just lay under the stars and talked. And two great things happened. Uh, one is that Muir said to TR, when are you going to get over your infantile need to kill things? <laughs> um, which might have led to him killing Muir. I mean, amazing that he was willing to stand right up to his friend TR and say, you know, this, this shooting thing is really not equal to your greatness. So Roosevelt said he only, you know, he only shot what should be shot. And he was against game butchers. And you know, he was against commercial hunting and so on. And then, but then on the third morning, they're under Half Dome, and it snowed. And, they, and Roosevelt said, we woke up covered with snow. Larry, I'm just going to guess that this has never happened to you, camping. <laughs> right? I mean, that, have you ever woken up? Well, have you ever been camping and awakened covered with snow? No. No, OK. So I, I haven't. It's have by no means a pleasurable experience. Yes, I have. Oh, OK. And, and so but Roosevelt wakes up covered with snow. And Muir is looking at him. And, Muir is, and then Roosevelt says, this is the greatest day of my life which he said hundreds of times. But, but he loved it because it was you know, authentic. And so here's a sign in Yosemite commemorating those conversations. OK, so then he goes on. So he's been in Yellowstone for two weeks with Burroughs. Then he goes to Yosemite. Then he goes to Santa Cruz in the Redwoods. This is not Redwood National Park, but in the Redwoods near in the Bay Area. And they had been waiting for him. This, everywhere he went, there were huge crowds and speeches and gifts and banquets and signing ceremonies and dedications and so on. And he went to Santa Cruz, and they had, it was one of the great stands of Redwoods. And they had put up signs saying, welcome TR and welcome Mr. President and bully and cheers to Roosevelt and so on. And he was offended by this. This is one of the great stories, I think, in, in the history of American conservation. So Roosevelt gets off the 
train, and they have tacked on to these redwoods mm. placards. And Roosevelt said, I don't like this. I am going to take a walk. And when I come back, if they're gone, I will give the speech I was going to give. But I mean, he was firm about this. This is not an appropriate, this would be like putting up a, you know, a Burger King poster in St. Peter's. And for Roosevelt, it's, well, see, you watched, it's that serious. And when he got back and they had dutifully taken down all the placards, he said, let me preach to you for a moment, which he did every day of his life anyway, but let me preach to you for a moment. All of us desire to see nature preserved. Above all, the trees should not be marred by placing cards of names on them. People who do that should be sternly discouraged. The cards give an air of ridicule to the solemn and majestic giants. They should be taken down. I ask you to keep all cards off the trees of any kind of signs that will mar them. Mar is one of his key words. See to it that the trees are preserved, that the gift is kept unmarred. You can never replace a tree. So he was pretty serious. And then this is what he didn't like. This is, you know, this is what he didn't like, is this kind of using nature, mediating it for industrial, commercial attractiveness. Um, and here is, look at this. I mean, of course, we cut down redwoods to this day. And, uh, but look at this. When you see this, you just think, wow, that is a big tree. Think of these were people that didn't have the internal combustion engine or chainsaws cutting down these 2,000-year-old trees. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I'm just saying that when you see it, it just shocks you how, how big the base is. And so he wanted something more for this period. So here's again what he said. Says Roosevelt, there can be nothing in the world more beautiful than the Yosemite, the groves of the giant sequoias and redwoods, the canyon of the Colorado, the canyon of the Yellowstone, the three Tetons. And our people should see it, see to it, that they are preserved for their children and their children's children forever with all their majestic beauty unmarred. Again, unmarred. And then he said, a grove of giant redwood or sequoia should be kept just as we keep a great and beautiful cathedral. And he, and he said in these speeches, these are our cathedrals. We don't have Notre Dame. We don't have St. Peter's. We don't have St. Paul's. We don't have Chartres. What we have is this. These are our cathedrals, and we need to treat them with the same respect and reverence and forbearance and sense of ownership, of desire to preserve them in their dignity that, that Europeans would treat those great architectural monuments. Here he is in the Grand Canyon. This is later. Uh, and then this is the full statement that he made on the North Rim. In the Grand Canyon, Arizona has a natural wonder which is in kind absolutely unparalleled throughout the rest of the world. I want to ask you to keep this great wonder of nature as it is now. I hope you will not have a building of any kind, not a summer cottage, a hotel, or anything else to mar the wonderful grandeur and sublimity, the great loneliness and beauty of the canyon. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages of men at work on it, and man can only mar it. So to summarize Roosevelt's achievement for American conservation, I, I just made a short list. He created five new national parks. We'll come back to that. When he became president, there were five. When he left the presidency, there were 10. He created five, including one in North Dakota. Number two, through the Boone and Crockett Club and during his presidency, he helped to save Yellowstone from adverse economic development. Really, and that was a pivotal moment about what direction the national parks were going to go in. Number three, um, he creating a method by which other federal entities could graduate into national park status. The most famous is so Congress didn't want to do much of this. Congress wasn't in a conservation mood. And Joe Cannon, the, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives from Ohio, came to Roosevelt and said, and I quote, not one cent for scenery not one cent for scenery. And so Roosevelt knew he couldn't get anything really through the Congress. He got, it was lucky that he got the five national parks that he did. And so he began, began increasingly to work in other methods by executive orders and so on. He invented the National Wildlife Refuge System by executive order. 
but he uh, decided that the, the Grand Canyon should be a national park, and he couldn't get any congressional traction for this idea. There was a lot of belief that they should be a railroad down in the, along the river and that there were mining opportunities there and grazing opportunities, and so no one would let him do it. So he, he used the Antiquities Act, the National Monuments and Antiquities Act, which was 1906, and he used it to designate the Grand Canyon as a national monument. <laughs> this is a pretty broad stretch of authority because when the Antiquities Act was passed in 1906, the intention was tiny little parcels of between five and 10 acres. <laughs> so like Devil's Tower or like you know, some cliff dwellings in Arizona, five to 10 acres minimum footprint, and Roosevelt uh, declared the Grand Canyon 828,000 acres <laughs> as a national monument and got away with it. It was, it was challenged in the federal courts. By and, executive order. By executive order alone. Mm -hmm. Think of this. Remember when Bill Clinton created Grand Staircase Escalante um, National Monument in Utah? And you, you would have thought he'd be impeached for it. It's one teeny little parcel. Um, so knowing that if he made something a national monument, it might graduate later into national park status, which the Grand Canyon did in 1919. Creating national forests out of which national parks could be carved or that protected the resources within national parks. Wasn't, excuse me, wasn't there a tension between the national forests and national parks, though? Yes. The national forests, this is an interesting, maybe Valerie can um, clarify this when we have her come up to talk, but the national Forest Service resisted the creation of the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. For one reason, for one thing, there's the traditional turf wars. They're both, they're both natural resource agencies. But secondly, they intelligently, they rightly understood that a lot of national parks were going to be carved out of their domain, that you're going to take a national forest somewhere in Wyoming and carve a national park out of it. So in a sense, it's a taking away from their, uh, their jurisdiction. Yeah. But uh, I, I seem to remember that the and maybe Valerie can address this, but in the national forests, there's multi-use, right, which could be economic use, M much more open to economic right. development, right? Exactly. So, what, Valerie, why don't so. you come up for a minute, if you would? Um, this is Valerie Naylor. You all know her, I'm sure. She'll come up a couple of times, but um, weigh in so far. Oh, uh, Dusty will get you a mic'd up. Well, I came to refute everything you said, oh, but good. I, I really can't. I, everything you've said has been spot on so far. Let's, let's call it a day then, shall we? Shall, yeah. shall we? But it, it, to the question that we just kind of stopped on here, the national forest versus the national park, is there still a tension between those two agencies or not? Well, I think there, there certainly can be in many areas because of the difference in missions. The national park follows the Organic Act, as you put on the screen, and the Multiple Use Sustained Yield, Yield Act is what the Forest Service works under as far as I know. So they have a multiple use mandate and it's often in conflict with a more of a preservation mandate that the Park Service follows. Okay, so um, did, did you get a sufficient answer to your question? Yep. yep. So let me, as well, long as you're there, go back to the Organic Act and those twin dynamics of unimpaired and recreation. Right, well to preserve unimpaired doesn't necessarily mean that there wouldn't be any facilities for visitors. Impairment is a very difficult word to define and in fact it's, it's a legal definition really as it relates to the National Environmental Policy Act. So one person's impairment might not be another's, but just because there are facilities doesn't mean that the nature is impaired. Uh, but if the purpose of the park is somehow reduced to the point that that purpose is, has, you know, is no longer viable, then that's when impairment would, would take place. I could give you examples of what Please. I think might be impairment. You know, for example, uh, there was a proposal for an an oil well right at the entrance to the Elkhorn Ranch unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And a few days ago, I went up to where that oil well was eventually being drilled, and it's not in any way visible from the National Park. But if it had been drilled right at the Elkhorn, I, in my opinion, just my opinion, the Elkhorn Ranch unit would have been impaired forever, or until that was all done, whatever comes first. Do you think that Yosemite Valley has been impaired? Well, that's a difficult one. It's changed over the years, and I'm not an expert on Yosemite, but there's definitely a lot of changes. You know, that's where it, it impairment is a difficult thing to prove or in 
for no apparent reason. But, um, but as far as overdevelopment, there's many parks that have been developed too much for many people's tastes, uh, certainly. But it, there is that balance that you have to play. But it's maybe not always as hard as, as what it may look like because the preservation portion of it really should come first. There was a man named Robin Winks who wrote a lot on that. Perhaps you've read that he's a National Park scholar. Uh, and that, that should always be the first thing we think about is preservation. And then as far as um, providing for the enjoyment by such means and such manner, that should come second. Last question before uh, we move on, then we'll call you up again. But so that there, over time in different administrations and so on, there are different ways of interpreting the Organic Act and different ways of deciding what the, where the balance should be kept in these great equations. And so um, one administration will move slightly more to this direction and another one that way. When you are a superintendent within the system, you have some capacity to determine those things yourself, right? I mean, it's not just directives. Different, different superintendents of your park, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, might have gone about their own business in slightly different ways. That's true. We do have guiding documents, such as the management policies. And so the way that one administration could influence things would be, for example, to rewrite the management policies. Because uh, the wheels of government turn slowly, as we all know. So it takes a while for something to be implemented. So what one administration starts is usually moved into another administration before it's finished. If it is ever finished, many things are started and not finished, good and bad. So I think that, uh, that that's um, kind of how it works. So yes, we have a lot of autonomy as superintendents, and so as long as we're working within the management policies, the superintendents of parks do have quite a bit of leverage, but they can often be overturned by someone higher up in the organization. But is, is it fair to say that your style as superintendent was more on the minimalist side to do as little to impair the natural experience as possible? Well, I would think that's true because I've been criticized many times for not putting a restroom along the loop road in Theodore Roosevelt National Park South Unit. And, you know, that's a pretty basic facility, but, you know, when I was there, I didn't really want to see a restroom somewhere where it would mar the scenery. And unless there was a place where it could be tucked away, I, I didn't want to see it there. So <laughs> I've been accused of being a minimalist, yes. So we'll come back to you, but thanks, thanks. for that so far. Um, so, okay, Larry, so insisting that the national parks were democratic, institution available to everybody. And then finally, and maybe most important for Roosevelt, I mean, he had all this influence in all these different ways. One of the great legislative masters in American history, you know, ranks with FDR and with Lyndon Johnson as able to get things done. Amazing how much he was able to get done, often against extraordinary odds. Um, but maybe the most important thing is the way Roosevelt exemplified what an American who loves national parks is like, and he nothing nothing pleased him more than to squat around a fire eating beans, and then to talk and look at the stars and to talk about America and to you know, lower your voice and to get up at first light and go wash your face in a cold stream, and and he just had that deep, deep, deep within his character, and he showed us what that looks like, and and the influence of that has been just gigantic. You know, I don't think you would see Bill Clinton doing that. I don't think you would see Richard Nixon doing that. It's a, it was, he was a particular sort of person who just thrived on that kind of roughing it in the big way. And so that created a, an ethos about how you do a national park. It's, so far as we know, he never went into any of the five that he created, uh, but, that, but he went into a lot of other ones. So let's just carry on. And creating a language about reverence and preservation, you've seen that. Here's what, now this is, this is, some of you have been there, I've stayed here, it's a wonderful place, Glacier Park Lodge. This is what he didn't really want. This was created by James J. Hill and local boosters. And this was back in the pleasure gardens for the privileged phase of the national park system. The, the Great Northern Railroad would go right into the park and drop you off at a lodge where um, a, a contractor that is either part of the Great Northern Railroad or friendly with the Great Northern Railroad would create amenities. So the idea was you get on a train in St. Paul or, or Chicago and you go out to, and you're dropped off at the door of the lodge where you're treated the way you would be at a 
at a resort, and then you do dabble a little in nature, and then you get back on the train and leave. Roosevelt thought that's the wrong pattern. That's the Aspen, Vale, elite, parks for the super rich philosophy, and he wanted it to be a place where every American could afford, if you could get to the, get to the perimeter, could afford to have that experience. But the lodge is beautiful. This is the interior, and it's amazing. So let's just quickly go through his national parks. Number one, Crater Lake. One of the most beautiful of all the parks, uh, May 22nd, 1902. So far as we know, Roosevelt was never there. And by the way, he didn't do these things alone. These things burble up from a lot of people. And the person Was who, this by executive order? No, this, the Congress has to create a national park. Okay. You cannot create a national park by executive order. Okay. What, what, you could, what, what was he creating by executive order then? National monuments. National oh, forests, okay. national the, wildlife refuges. That could grow into that. Right, part. right. Okay. So the, but the person who did a lot of this was John F. Lacey, a Republican um, representative from Iowa, 1841 to 1913. And here's just quickly his achievement. The Lacey Act of 1900 is still critically important. It makes it a federal offense to transport artifacts and peltries and so on across state lines. So if you poach in a park or kill something like a mountain lion that's protected or or um, um, an owl that's protected somewhere and, and try to take it across state lines. The Lacey Act made that a very serious crime. Um, he was responsible for seeing through the legislation on Crater Lake. He was responsible for seeing through the legislation on Wind Cave in South Dakota. And he was the co-author of the Antiquities Act, the National Monuments Act of 1906. He's a huge figure in the history of conservation. And he, he lives in the shadow of Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt. He shouldn't. There's not even an adequate biography of him. He's Iowa, but he was very important. So if his first was Crater Lake, his second was Wind Cave. Wind Cave is, has 130 miles of caves, one of the largest caves in the world. I think 80-some percent of all the box uh, materials like this. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly important, unusual sort of national park. Uh, have you been to it? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And here's the, it's also been very important in the, in the um, recovery of the bison. The bison at one time, 35, maybe 60 million of them. By the time Roosevelt shot his in September of 1883, there maybe were 2,000 left in America. So think of it, tens of millions down to about 2,000. And the Boone and Crockett Club and other organizations then began to try to save the buffalo. And they actually got some, they think, purebloods from the West and, and took them to the Bronx Zoo, of all places, where they began to proliferate. And when Wind Cave was created, uh, a small number from the Bronx Zoo came out to create the, the basis, the, the early basis of what's the beautiful herd of bison now at Wind Cave. That was the second, third, Sully's Hill. How, how many of you have actually been to Sully's Hill? It used to be a national park. It's now a national game preserve. It was uh, de declared by Congress June 3rd, 1904. It's a long and interesting story. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on this at the Roosevelt Center in, in Dickinson, trying to figure out exactly how this came to be a national park. Roosevelt was never there, so far as we know. I mean, I mean no disrespect, but it really is not sublime in the same sense that the Grand Tetons are sublime. And it was um, in the 1930s, it was changed into a U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, facility. It was re the jurisdiction left the National Park Service. It has bison, and it has a, a, a wonderful bird population and some beautiful woodlands and mid midgrass prairies and so on. But it really was marginal. And here's what the sort of the official history, short history of the National Park Service says about this. There were as yet no clear standards for national parks, however, and few suffered a few suffered by comparison among the, the suffering was Sully's Hill, an undistinguished tract in North Dakota that was later transferred to the Agriculture Department as a game preserve. And here's what uh, Douglas Brinkley says. He's a friend of ours, and of Randy Hudson Bueller's and Shiloh's. It's a remote site, and the fact that it was named after a general known for Indian massacres have also given this park, in a sense, an orphan status. Only the WPA Guide for North Dakota has ever really done this hilly, serene woodland justice. I think that might be slightly unfair to General Sully, but, uh, but he was an Indian fighter, that's for sure. So it was demoted. That was his only national park in North Dakota. 
Then he did Mesa Verde. You were there a couple years ago, uh, June 29th, 1906. It came at the same time as the Antiquities Act, and if the Antiquities Act had been in place, he probably would have made that a national monument, because that's exactly the sort of property that the National Antiquities Act was meant to protect. And then finally, Platt in uh, Oklahoma, since been, in 1978, it was um, made a national recreation area, so it's no longer a national park. But the, so two of his five have been demoted, um, Sully's Hill and Platt. And Platt has, a, has some springs. It's a little on the kind of uh, mini Yellowstone or mini hot springs side of the equation. It's at a place called Sulphur Springs in Oklahoma. And it has this little waterfall that's called Little Niagara. This is an early photo. Here's one from the 50s. So it really was more of like what you'd expect in a, a state park with more of that kind of recreational activity. And then, furthermore, TR, um, having made five national parks, doubling the size of the system, also named the first 18 um, national monuments. Devil's Tower was the first. And of those, four have become national parks. And he reckoned that that was one of the ways they would graduate up. Lawson Peak in California, Mount Olympus, which is Olympic National Park in Washington, Grand Canyon, we've already talked about in Petrified Forest. So in a way, Roosevelt gave us nine national parks because the five that he produced, perhaps minus two, and then the four others that graduated later. It's impossible to exaggerate his influence, his greatness in this regard. I mean, no, imagine if, if McKinley had lived. If McKinley had not been assassinated and he had served his second term, and maybe for whatever reason Roosevelt never became the 26th president of the United States or any president, this could be a very different equation. I mean, it, it took somebody with a, with a really deep fascination and commitment to this to make this happen, and, and he did it maybe in the last time when it could still be done before the country got so settled, going back to your early question, got so settled that there would be so much backlash that it would be impossible. But he, I mean, you, whenever you stop to try to think about this, you just, you wind up just feeling deep admiration and fascination for Roosevelt for having this fixed idea. It was only one of them. Panama was another. The Great White Fleet was a third. Um, you know, fixing the police force of New York. Civil service reform. He had many giant ideas, but maybe his greatest, well, certainly one of his greatest achievements was on behalf of conservation. And then just quickly, what about our park? Uh, our lovely, beautiful, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Um, there's a book about this, if you're interested, uh, that was published um, here um, about this um, by David Harmon at the open margin, the NPS's administration of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Really, really an interesting book. And I'll just quickly say what happened. There had been a move for a long time to create something in the Badlands. The, the Northern Pacific Railroad used to call it Pyramid Park and was using it as a kind of uh, roadside promotion. Uh, there was talk of a state park. Uh, there were, at one time, it was briefly, for a very few months, a National Wildlife Refuge. It was studied. There was something called the RDA Studies, and it was studied for a long time. Different teams from the National Park Service and from Congress came out between 1920 and, and 1947 to study it. And whenever this happened, for whatever reason, it didn't become a national park. And to be perfectly honest about it, although it's a little painful to talk about, the National Park Service was not in favor of this. They regarded Theodore Roosevelt, this, this, this place, as interesting, impressive, but below the threshold of uniqueness or sublimity that made for a, a successful nomination to the national park system. And so the National Park would send out, Park System would send out experts, and they, would, they wrote some fairly negative reports about this place and said, it probably doesn't rise to the level of National Park. We don't feel that way, but, but it was felt that way by many. So in 1946, William Lemke, um, who has roots in the Nonpartisan League, and was a, a North Dakota member of the House of, 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 the House of Representatives, Lemke, successfully got through legislation in Congress to create Theodore Roosevelt National 
Memorial Park, no, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, and it would have just been the south unit. So we have three units, the north unit, the south unit, and the Elkhorn Ranch unit. They'd all been studied, but the legislation that Lemke was able to get passed in the Truman administration would have created Theodore Roosevelt National Park in the south unit. Harry Truman was president, he pocket vetoed it. He didn't veto it, but he vetoed it by leaving it in his pocket and after X number of days passed. That's the equivalent of a veto. And he was advised by interior people that it just wasn't enough. So the next year, Lemke went back to the drawing board, had more hearings, brought congressional allies out here, and he added the Elkhorn, not the North Unit. It was now going to be the, essentially what's now the South Unit, plus the 218 acres of the Elkhorn Ranch. And for whatever reason, Truman gave up his opposition at that point and signed the bill. And so Theodore Roosevelt National Memorial Park was created in 1947, thanks to William Lemke and the work of a lot of others. And it included the Elkhorn Ranch and the South Unit. A year later, in 1948, the North Unit was added. So that's how we got where we are. Uh, here, this is a really bad photograph, but I still like it. Um, visit Theodore Roosevelt National Memorial Park, dedication July 4th, 1949. And look, sponsored by the Greater North Dakota Association, the State Chamber of Commerce. This was, again, that desire to create a tourism industry. Um, here's an early photo of the entrance. You can still go to the old entrance station. You have to hike about a mile. It's really beautiful. Um, and here's what the National, or the Roosevelt Memorial National Park Association, which was really a creature of the State Chamber of Commerce said, a part of, this is the original plan, no, the second plan. A part of the plan is the construction of a state and national highway from Marmoth to Watford City, following the edge of the Little Missouri River Canyon with many observation points from which the beauty of the Badlands may be appreciated. That never happened. So there were three stages of this in the proposal. And some, if there were Little Missouri Valley ranchers in the room, they would gasp at some of this. Stage one was going to be a giant park. The original plan put forward by the Greater North Dakota Association, the State Chamber of Commerce, was for a giant park of 1.3 million acres. That would make it larger than Yellowstone, right out in the heart of mm. Western North Dakota. It would have been at the, it would have been either the largest or second largest national park in the country, and it would have included what we call the Badlands, essentially. That um, all is one unit. All is one giant unit. It was just going to almost what George Catlin had in mind, like this Great Plains Badlands Little Missouri Park. That didn't work. Number two was still huge. It was going to be a large park, 12 to 14 miles wide, so essentially the corridor of the Little Missouri River from Marmoth in extreme southwestern North Dakota all the way to the Kildare Mountains. It would have been a crescent from Marmoth and it would have gone past Bullion Butte and then up past Pretty Butte and Bullion Butte and it would have come up to where the amphitheater is and it would have included the Maltese Cross Cabin which is privately owned. It would have included the South Unit or most of it. It would have gone to the Elkhorn and would have gone all the way to Watford City to the Kildare Mountains. It would be this giant 12 to 14 mile wide crescent um, of essentially the, the heart of the Little Missouri River Valley in western North Dakota. By now, the uh, grazing interests had really gotten their act together and uh, opposed that. So what then happened in 1947 was the three units separated of what's now Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And then in 1978, it graduated up to become not a national memorial park anymore, but a full-on national park. John Burroughs was less impressed than TR. When Burroughs came here in 1903 on that trip, he called it a land utterly demoralized and gone to the bad, flayed, fantastic, treeless, a riot of naked clay slopes, chimney-like buttes, and dry coolies. So Roosevelt had the right stuff. Burroughs was really more of the squirrel in the tree variety of parks. You know, it's a, what a lovely sylvan setting. Look at the fall leaves. Um, it was the ruggedness that uh, T.R. loved. Here's Burroughs. And here's Burroughs fishing. 
So just one, one tiny little piece, and then we'll open it to questions. You get Valerie back up here. Yeah. Your voice, I'm sure, will be back. <clears throat> I'm working on it. Yeah. So if you think about this for a minute, everyone, here we are at the centennial. So we do have the greatest national park system in the world. We created the national parks. Yellowstone was the world's first national park. If you just name some of them, it just you just get thrilled to think of things like Canyon Lands and Great Bend National Park and Rocky Mountain National Park. I mean, we have some of the most beautiful national park lands that you could even imagine. I mean, we did get the, some of the pick of North America in all of this, but now that it's the centennial, 2016, what would be, what would be a really heroic way to commemorate this. You know, already the National Park Service has dozens of little projects to create this and do that or dismantle this and so on. But it's pretty heavily on programming and marketing. Nothing grand, because that's not the mood of our times. But here are things that I've been reading about that we could do. Number one, attempt to harmonize the artificial park borders with the actual ecosystems that they're meant to protect. So if you think about it, a national park is sort of an arbitrary circle or square that somebody designated for whatever reason. And when these were mostly created, we didn't really understand ecology. I mean, we literally didn't understand it. And so we didn't realize that you have to, that if you take Yellowstone, here's Yellowstone, the most famous example of all. If you look in the center of this, you see Yellowstone National Park. It's large, it's amazing. But the actual ecosystem of the grizzly bears and the elk and, and so on, is this larger zone. And so the, the elk and the grizzly bears and the wolves don't know where the boundary is. They want to do what they do. And so they, they will then either come up against the fence or they will get out of the park. My mother has a little teeny cabin right next to Cook City and when they do, the park service often, not always, has to put down the grizzly bear because it's a menace problems of brucellosis and you know, all sorts of things that, that are raised along these perimeters. But these creatures don't know any better. They, they need to roam. They need this sort of habitat. The park is great. It's America's treasure. But it doesn't actually cover the, the eco footprint of, of the species and things that it's trying to protect. And so that creates obvious management problems and adjacent landowner and adjacent development problems. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, sure, you do, I try know. that, you yeah. know. I'm not saying we should do this. Because it's private property. No, most of this is of public it. property. Most of this is national forest and BLM. But there's a lot of private inholdings and private property. And I'm not suggesting that that be. Mm -hmm. But, okay. but you, if, you ha if you had the national will, if, if Lyndon Johnson were president and he had the kind of Congress that he had then, he might say, let's go here now and let's do what we can. Let's fix some corridors, some key habitat areas. Let's add some acreages, try to make it contiguous. We can't do all of this, but where it's other federal lands, federal forest or BLM, well, let's see if we can't either find a super management plan, which they're already working on, or actually convert some of these properties into full national park jurisdiction so that we can do justice by the very thing we're trying to show the world here. It would be possible to do that. Think that'll happen? No, that's not the mood of our times. But this should be done not just there, but in a whole range of parks. Here's the Elkhorn Ranch. This is an issue that every North, North Dakotan should think about. When Roosevelt lived out here, he had a ranch of tens of thousands of acres. The, he didn't own any, of, own any of this land. He was a squatter like almost everybody else. But the custom out here, the custom law, Larry, was that you, once you found your ranch, the Maltese or the Elkhorn or whatever it was, you were entitled by squatter law, by custom law, to a ranch four miles south of your homestead and four miles north of your homestead and out to the edge of the valley. So that 12 to 14 mile corridor, let's say, or even 20 in some places, and then eight miles. That was his ranch. That was the Elkhorn Ranch. Thousands of acres. Today, 218 acres are part of the national park jurisdiction there. And Valerie was saying that along the perimeter, there is inevitably going to be development. And you probably all remember the Ebert's Ranch controversy of a number of years ago. Now the Ebert's Ranch is um, owned by the National Forest Service, and it's, it's trying to manage it as part of the, the larger picture.
but there are private ranchers there, there are private minerals there. If you really wanted to do this, and I'm not saying we should or, or will, but if you really wanted to protect in the fullest sense Theodore Roosevelt's Elkhorn Ranch, you would have to expand that property or enter into extremely um, cooperative relationships with other state and national agencies to make this happen. But if you don't, if you just, if you just say, look, the Elkhorn is the Elkhorn, that's what we've got. It's almost inevitable that there will be impairing industrial activity on the periphery of the Elkhorn, which is one of the places where TR became TR. And so ideally, if, 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 you could, if, there, were a, if there were a consensus, you'd want to do something like this. There is no consensus for this. And you know, there's this continuous talk about putting a bridge somewhere in here. If this were, this is much more likely if you don't increase the the protection around that, that homestead. So there, but these are only two of hundreds. Number two, remove unnecessary infrastructure within parks. That's being done, but you could do a lot more. Number three, this gets controversial. Remove automobiles from many of the parks, and there are several, like Denali, where that's already being done, where you have to go in and buses and so on. In the winter in, in Yellowstone, you, you can take a snow buggy, and I've done that. It's a fabulous experience. But they've tried three or four or five times to re remove snowmobiles from Yellowstone without success. Uh, you know, I understand both sides of this argument. And now they require most of the, of the uh, snowmobiles to be guided. And they have some strict restrictions on numbers. And they have to be four cycles rather than two cycles. And they have to have noise abatement. And, they, and the, the leader guides try to move around the herds. But it's not just that it's kind of snowmobile culture where you do get some kind of noisy running around. It's more than that. Because when I was there a few years ago, the rangers were explaining to us that Yellowstone is really a winter park, much more than it is a summer park. And these bison and other creatures like elk and so on are really on a very tight life margin against these long winters, that it's really a, it's not automatic that they're going to survive. And if you have a lot of scaring of them and stirring them up and making them move in ways that they wouldn't naturally, you can impair the capacity of an individual bison or elk to survive. And so really, ideally, if you were just thinking about unimpaired or just about preservation of the herds, you would probably not want to have snowmobiles in the park or, or, or have them restricted to just a few areas. But politically, that is a very hot potato. And people love it. People, I know people who absolutely love doing this. And they think, hey, it's a national park. It's winter. Why can't we take our snowmobiles? And finally, this is, of course, the least likely of my proposals, create one more giant, fabulous American national park. Where would that be? Most of the places, of course, have been taken, you could say. But here are two, Larry. You and I have been okay. to one of them. Uh, what about these? Of course, I have not consulted Montana, but, um, <laughs> uh, but you could do a grizzly bear national park in, in, in northwestern Montana. There's a lot of wilderness, and there's a lot of forest service, and a lot of BLM up there. And you, would, there would be, you could leave some inholdings, and you, could, you, know, there, you wouldn't have to take people off of their places. But there is enough land up there that if you really wanted to, you could probably create a grizzly bear national park there if you felt like it. I don't see it happening. The other one would be where the true source of the Missouri is on that Montana-Wyoming border. That's pretty wild country out there, too. And you could create a kind of gathering of waters because the Snake Shoshone waters flow in one direction and the Missouri-Yellowstone waters flow in another. And it's some of the most pristine scenery in the world. I guess most of that's federal property already. Exactly. So I mean, you, if, you, if there were really a national will, this could probably be done. You'd have to pay a lot of people you know, to quit their claims on things and to buy out recreational facilities. And there'd be lawsuits in every direction. And, but this happens every time. This happened in the 60s, too, and in the 70s. If the national will were there in Wyoming, in Utah, in Colorado, in Arizona, in Texas, there are places where you could still do one more or a couple more great national parks. I just. You don't see that happening, right? I mean, it's, it seems very unlikely. But wouldn't that be something if we did it? If we could just one more giant and just say, you know, we realize we, we got the big ones with Teton and Glacier and so on. But 
this would be like the, in my opinion, the greatest service we could do to the national park system and create worldwide excitement over this. But there would be people whose oxes are gored, and there would be, un I can't even imagine the pushback. But it's worth thinking about, I think. Anyway, Valerie, why don't you come back? Then we're going to take questions. We have all this time. You're going to speak, or are you just done now? Uh, <laughs> what happened to you, you know? I don't know. What's this, that job was getting you down or something? <laughs> May so, I rec refute a couple of things? Yeah, of course. Um, let's see. We've got another microphone here. So if raise your hand if you have a question. Questions, we're going to get a microphone over to you. All right. Go ahead, Val. Par Carlos have... got a microphone, and, and we really ask you to wait on the microphone, please. To no, get it gets it. to you because they're TV, right? Yep, yep, because it's all being taped and all that. Go ahead, Valerie. So, but anyway, okay. go ahead. Well, I want to say that those folks that work for the National Park Service and for many visitors, we don't differentiate very much among the different types of national park areas. There are now 407 units of the national park system and so Clay talks about graduating to national park status, but the National Park Service doesn't look at it that way. Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site is just as important as Rocky Mountain National Park, is just as important as, as Gateway National Recreation Area. So you don't find that differentiation very much in the national park system. We call them all parks. Nobody says, I'll meet you at the National Historic Site. They'll say, I'll meet you out in the park in a minute. And it may be Fort Union Trading Post National Historic Site or, or Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. But we, as Park Service folks, all call them parks and think of them the same, and they're managed pretty much the same. When I would see a book that would say that Theodore Roosevelt National Park was established in 1978, I always cringe because it was established as Theodore Roosevelt National Memorial Park, as Clay mentioned, in 1947. And that's the year that should be used for its establishment. Uh, there were two park areas set aside prior to Yellowstone, the Hot Springs Reservation in Arkansas in 1832. Uh, it didn't become a national park till 1921, but it was set aside as a pleasuring ground for the people. It was sort of a pre-national park set aside. And also, uh, President Lincoln set aside Yosemite in 1864, gave it to the state to manage, but that was also a national attempt at establishing a national park. It later became a national park. So I just wanted to make that clear that all of these national park areas, including the six that were recently established by President Obama, um, all are treated pretty much the same by the National Park Service. And it's really just clay that differentiates, or maybe the public in general. Um, I also wanted to say that I don't believe, I disagree with Clay, that it's inevitable that there has to be impairing development around the Elkhorn Ranch, because that's really up to all of us, isn't it, as to whether we let that happen. It doesn't have to. Thanks. <laughs> we have a question. Sonia. Um, just uh, um, if you'll bear with me to give you kind of a recap of what I heard, because it'll give context for my question. Thomas Jefferson, if you go to Monticello, you'll see artifacts from the Westford expansion, some will say escapism, of the American Indian will be in display in his uh, foyer as you go in. And we're looking at Theodore Roosevelt with the idea of man and beast, the relationship, preserving the environment in which that was able to occur. But have we given some value or, or celebrated the fact that it's also a monument to the cultural heritage of our country and social evolution that's occurred within that context of those, that environment. I think that's a wonderful value of the national parks as well. And I, I wanted to um, invite your thoughts on that as well. Well, it's certainly true that, the, I mean, I agree 100% with what, what you're saying. And the National Park Service has really been proactive, especially in the second half of the 20th century and now in, in, in recognizing that and wanting to be careful about that. And so there are places um, like Canyon de Chez uh, where you go and you can't just wander around. You have to have a, a, a Native American who is certified to be there, who's decide, decided to be there to take you to see places. And that provides a restraining context and a, and a, and a contextualization of the experience. Mesa Verde uh, is doing this. This is increasingly being done. This is a cultural value that was ignored to a certain degree for a while, and now has, I think, taken on much more importance and probably will continue to take on importance. And with the passage of NAGPRA, the Native Americans Grave uh, 
Repatriation Act in 1992, it really changes the equations. And so I think this is, we're looking, to, we're moving now towards the 21st century park, and I think it's quite different from the Yellowstone model of the 1950s, where you, you all park and watch the grizzly bears eat from the garbage dump. That was one national park. These, each era kind of has to redefine the national park system within these broad guidelines of the Organic Act and, and other key pieces of, of legislation and, and, and management policy. But where, whenever I go to the national parks, I see much more emphasis on the native peoples who were there. And if you look at Ken Burns' uh, really brilliant uh, national parks documentary, he, he was largely about the cultural history of the national parks, the kind of people who visit, what kind of cars, what kind of buggies, um, horses, mules. Um, you know, he wanted to look at the parks as a, as a social environment as much as in the kind of Jefferson sublime notion. So I think that's a, a really useful corrective. Thanks for it. However, I would like to weigh in on this. Oh, if I go can, ahead. No, your voice is back. Finally, good. I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we need a balance. Okay. Um, I, I probably get myself in a lot of trouble on this, uh, what I'm about to say here, but the reality is that I think everybody knows I'm incredibly sympathetic to the Native American I causes. Have books and, on this issue. And, and, and so forth. But the last time I was down at Mesa Verde, and I've been to Mesa Verde probably a half a dozen times, okay. and my parents took me the first time, was in, I remember distinctly, it was in 1959, and I was back in the 60s, and I was back in the 70s, took my kids there in the 70s and the 80s, and most recently took my uh, granddaughter down there here last summer, I guess it was. And as we toured, the rangers that are walking you through these just magnificent ruins, and if you've never been to Mesa Verde, it is, it's, it is life changing to realize, in fact, and then I'll get back to my point. Um, when I was teaching at the Air Force Academy, there was a, a British officer, exchange officer that was there, and at the going away, uh, going away dinner that we had for him, and he was leaving, and he was talking about America and how great it was to have been here. Um, uh, teaching in, in the American West, and he said, for every American that believes their history began in 1492, they have never been to Mesa Verde. And it's great. You know, Mesa Ver Verde is abandoned by 1250, okay? But so the, the park rangers walking us through there never once talked about the Anasazi, never used the term Anasazi, never once talked about the archaeological digs that have occurred at Mesa Verde that have been incredibly valuable in understanding the people who were really the ancestors of today's Pueblo Indians in New Mexico. Not one comment about the archaeological digs. Everything, everything they talked about had to do with the, with the, um, the spiritual aspects of Mesa Verde and sort of the spiritual history of Mesa Verde. And I'm all for that. I get that. I understand it. But I don't understand why we're not talking about the archaeological digs that have occurred there and what they have told us about the ancestors to the Pueblo Indians. And after a half day of, of going on these various tours, there were two rangers standing there together. And I walked up and I said, excuse me, I have a question. And so they're both standing there. And I said, why aren't we talking about the Anasazis or archaeology here? And one looked at the other and he says, you handle it, and he walked away. <laughs> and, handle what? I mean, what, they regard you as an old crank? Yeah, I guess. No, and he said, you handle it, and he walked away. And the reality is that with, with various native groups, they have signed agreements that they will not talk about the Anasazis. They will not talk about the archaeological digs. That's what the, the park ranger told me. This doesn't make any sense to me. The, you know, certainly you have to be sympathetic to the, to, to, to the plight. You, you have to be sensitive to the culture. You have to be incredibly um, in tune into what that Mesa Verde can mean to the native peoples. I get all of that. And that should be part of what you're doing. But I just think that it's gone too far. And I don't know, maybe Valerie wants to respond to that. Well, first of all, while we wait for Valerie, Larry, I uh, you, I know you... Aren't you uh, glad I got my boy? Yeah, back. great, just in time. Uh, I think if you'd gone there six weeks later, you might have had a very different experience. And that's what I wanted to say as well. Uh, they don't use the term Anasazi anymore. 
Uh, that's just not a term that's used. It's, it's outdated. But as far as the tours, a program, interpretive programs have themes. And it's likely, they're not supposed to be about just anything and everything. They're supposed to follow a theme. And even more so now than what you would find 30 years ago. It's very theme oriented. And the rangers individually have some leeway into what they talk about and what themes they pick from a larger group of themes that are part of the interpretive plan. So it's very possible that you happen to get there on a spiritual tour theme maybe two spiritual tour themes, but I, I agree with Clay that if you went there three weeks later or six weeks later or maybe the next day, you would have a very different experience. So I don't think you can base the interpretive programs at Mesa Verde or any other park on what you see on any one day. Also, I did check into that because you told me this story a while back, and uh, when I mentioned that it. to recent employees <laughs> of Mesa Verde, they didn't, that didn't resonate with them at all. So I think it was just the day you were there. So I, take heart, Larry. Fair enough. Take heart. Fair go enough. back, because you. I'll go back. It's time. I love. The, I love Mesa Verde. It's time for another trip, and that makes it interesting. That's why you don't just go to a national park one time. Every time you go, there's something different, and there's a different emphasis. And often people will come to Medora every year, but they don't go into the national park every year. I've asked people, and they say, "Well, we come out every year." I say, "When's the last time you went in the park?" They go, "Well, 1984. I was there." <laughs> and I think, well, you know, the changes with the seasons, the changes with the year, it changes with the precipitation and the, the lighting and everything. And if you haven't been there for a while, uh, just as you come to see the musical every year in Medora, you should definitely go into the park and you'll have a completely different experience every time. Thanks. So other questions? We have a little more time. Hello. Lots of questions? Hello. Here's one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you for this. I, uh, I grew up on an ethnically cleansed portion of the Grand Sioux Reservation, Adams County. And, and I'm, I'm so happy to to know, and I've been to the canyon lands, they used to call it. And, but what, I, what I'd like to note is that uh, many of these parks were created with great coercion imposed upon Native America. You think of the, uh, the Olympic Park uh, and, and uh, think of, of the, uh, the hunting rights that have been viciously suppressed. Uh, think of Isle Royal. Uh, think of the Apostle Islands. Uh, basically, good Democrats, liberals, were threatening the tribes that had interests there. And so I just commend to you uh, that, that we begin to think of the ecosystem as containing the remnants of those people who say they're still here. One of the greatest insults we have, I think, is to suggest that they're gone. Their genetics are still here. And, and I don't know if I see very many Native Americans here. I don't think I see any. So the invitation ought to be made in a very emphatic way that uh, you people, uh, you people are, are originals. You, you are important. And not only are we interested in the bison, but we're interested in the bison hunters and the fishermen and fishing rights. Uh, they, they come up with, with all of the parks that have significant watersheds. There were fishing interests there. And, and I'd just like to say that that, uh, that I hope is the, the vision, not only expanding the ecosystem, and not shooting the bison that come out across the border, but letting those who need to hunt the meat, perhaps hunt them in a traditional, respectful way. So that's my thought. That's a great, uh, great point. I do think um, if I were just maybe, I, well, I don't dare speak for Valerie, but I think, I, I, I think Valerie would say the National Park Service is really making significant initiatives in this regard, certainly on the cultural front. It's a little harder when you talk about things like fishing rights and so on because it, it butts up against a lot of other codes that are deeply into the National Park System protocols. But, uh, but you know, it may be, and I, I hadn't thought of this, and I'm, I'm so glad everyone is, is talking about this. I, maybe it's, we've reached the time when we need to decommission a park or two also. Maybe, you know, maybe some things were done that were just so um, high-handed or unjust that, it, that we should contemplate undoing some things in whatever ways we think we realistically can. But I, I, I think that's a really important I'd like to ask Valerie a question on this because uh, I think the, the point is excellent. Um, and we do know that uh, up in the Northwest, for example, there are, and I'm just using it as an example, uh, treaty rights that Indians have to, to, uh, to go fishing. And, and it always irritates the, the white guys because they can't go fish in there, but the natives have a treaty and they can go fish in there. Um, if that watershed goes into a national park, uh, can those natives follow that if the treaty gave them fishing rights on that river? Is that a fair question? 
She doesn't know. She just says she doesn't know. Yeah. That. Okay. But it's an interesting question. Yeah. And I, thank you for raising that point. It's an excellent point. Sir. Um, about a month ago, I was uh, on my computer uh, watching two guys argue back and forth up in Alaska about a movement in Congress to sell national park property, I assume because of the $18, $19 trillion debt we have. And I'm just wondering, have you heard anything of that, any validity and stuff like this? Well, that kind of, the, the, you know, the question is about selling off parts of the public domain. There's a, there's a broad um, conversation going on about what to do with federal lands. And there are people who believe that they should all be privatized, that, that the federal government has no um, business owning any land, that if there's a willing buyer for anything, that it should be sold. This, this conversation usually occurs with respect to BLM and national forest, and, and often in Nevada, uh, more than it does with national parks. But there are, there are people, and I, and I meet them sometimes in my travels, who say the federal government is, is the last entity we want owning any property that, that the market could dispose of in a different way, that the market is the, um, is, is the best um, protocol we have for our use of these lands and, and, and that uh, it's sometimes called the tragedy of the commons. When there is a commons, uh, it creates a whole set of unintended problems. So this conversation goes on. My sense is it's a still pretty small and, and the national parks are usually regarded as off limits for this conversation. And certainly the national monuments off limits to this conversation. But if, if you're talking about a, a large tract of BLM land in the center of Nevada, that conversation is very hot. But in Alaska where it really is the case that Alaska has, is so federalized in different ways that there are only a small number of private parcels. I mean, Alaska is sort of full Nevada in a certain too. people. You mentioned Nevada. Nevada, Nevada, Nevada is 93% federal. Yeah. I lived there for many years, and it's, a, it's really interesting. Um, you know, but there's a reason why it's 93% federal. It's not, it's not Iowa. If it were Iowa, it would be 0% federal. It was so rugged that homesteaders failed and the land went back to uh, the public domain or it was never homesteaded at all. But, but it's still open under the 1872 mining law and many other development protocols. And the National Wilderness has the highest restraint on use, National Park's pretty high, and then it, 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 it becomes more uh, flexible when you get to National Forest and BLM. But, but the conversation uh, does occur, but almost never about National Parks. Since the uh, Black Hills are sacred to the Lakota people, I ha and I have heard that uh, they can get permission there to do sacred uh, ceremonies, I'm wondering how they get that permission and if it's how it's restricted or if they have to pay. Um, can you speak to that? It's, uh, Ari, do you know anything about this? Uh, Native peoples have worked with the Forest Service and other federal bureaus to get permission to do prayer work or to have uh, ceremonial events on the national, it's usually the national forest, I think, but I'm sure there's a permitting system. Do you know anything about this? Well, the Black Hills as a whole are sacred, but there are many places that are sacred, but only there's only a few national parks in the Black Hills, and then there's the Forest Service land and private land, so there's no one system for everything. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you're speaking well, the of. Question, but, but the question is, let's say that I'm the Lakota, oh, the yeah. hook and I want to do something on the, these yeah. lands. You know, there are a lot, of, a lot of examples in national parks where the native peoples can come in and do traditional things um, that others wouldn't be able to do. I mean, I could name a dozen national parks, Pipestone National Monument, for one, where they can go and actually quarry the Pipestone still. So there's lots of different things. And I think the Park Service is becoming more and more sensitive to those issues over time. But the question was, is the, is, does this require paperwork and is there compensation involved? I, I think that varies from place to place depending on the enabling legislation of the parks and what it would entail. But I, I, I don't know that a permit would, a permit might be required, but it probably wouldn't cost anything in most cases. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And Bear Butte is actually a state, state park, park, I right. think. Yes, Bear it Butte. Is. Any more questions we can't answer? Here's one back here. Oh, and there's one over here too, so. Vanna White is carrying the microphone over there. 
Clay, you made reference to um, the idea of making perhaps more national parks and Grizzly Bear National Park, I think was the name of one. And the reason I'm against that is exactly for the reason uh, that you mentioned about wilderness areas. They have even more restrictions on them. And it seems to me like that's very in line with what Roosevelt, you know, designed in the beginning. So for that reason, I'd be absolutely against uh, national parks, especially in that, that wilderness heavy area of uh, Montana, Idaho. Yeah, good. Great point. If you create a national park, it will be used. Yeah. There will be <laughs> hookups and souvenir shops and curios. And, uh, yeah, of course. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but maybe that's not the best place to do it. Any other questions? Any other questions, comments? Oh, here we go. I think there's a, an opportunity perhaps a citizen for another great national park, but it wouldn't be in the West. Uh, the North Woods of Maine is someplace that a lot of people have talked about. And if you Google Maine North Woods, uh, there's a potential there for a large three million acre national park that would rival the Great Western Parks. So uh, I don't know the status of that proposal right now, but it's something to think about. Not all of the great unadulterated lands are in the West. Yeah, good point. Last chance, anyone? Well, Larry, I think you're okay. we're done here. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next season. Thank you.